We get letters. Here in Walla Walla, all our mail comes by train. Today's Walla Walla Gazette is dated May 25th, 1895. A hot fire. The frame building on the corner of Main and Colville streets was gutted by fire Sunday evening last. The upper story was occupied by Mr. and Mrs. E. W. Carr and conducted as a boarding house and lodging house. The lower storeroom contained the grocery stock of R. Ludwig's. The car household property was completely destroyed, being insured for only $250. The grocery store was removed with damage, but without much actual loss. The cause of the fire is unknown. Harry Kretz, the owner of the edifice, will be reimbursed to the extent of $1,500 insurance. Mr. Ludwig has opened up in another place. Wilbur Frisk Brock, the editor of the Walla Walla Gazette, is a mountaineer. He is credited to being the first explorer to cross and ascend into the summit of the great glacier of the Selkirks, the only one who ever passed a night on the center of the flow, the first and only climber to cross the crevasses at the base of Division Mountain. The Great Glacier of the Selkirks, by the way, is selected by the editors of the New Standard Dictionary as an ideal illustration of a glacier. It is greater in extent and volume than all the ice fields of the Alps combined, and it is regarded as the largest body of ice on the American continent south of Alaska. Notice, your attention is called to the closing out of Miss Kaufman's entire stock of millinery. This is your chance for a stylish hat cheap. Anyone thinking of going into millinery business will find it to their interest to see her, as she will sell fixtures and stand at a bargain. A Stolen Wheel a fine-looking bicycle was standing in the Pacific Express Company storeroom last Saturday. It attracted the attention of several wheelmen on account of its peculiar make. The front plate bearing the name had been removed, and the only thing to designate the factory of origin of the machine was an imprint on the leather tool case, Andre. The tag showed that the shipment had been made from Rockford to one Frank Mitchell Walla Walla. As no one by that name was known here, there was speculation as to who the owner might prove to be. All doubts were allayed Saturday night, however, when the express manager here received a telegram from the constable of Rockford ordering the wheel returned as it was stolen property. Mitchell stole the machine from the Ziegler block in Spokane and rode it to Rockford. To throw off his pursuers, he shipped it to Walla Walla, paying $1.80 in express charges in advance, and started to walk after it. The machine was an Andre, a make of which there are but two in Spokane. It attracted considerable attention among the Rockford bicyclists. And when a little group with Constable O.J. Harris as a central figure had gathered around it, someone inquired, What make is that anyway? Oh, uh, Columbia, Mitchell answered unsuspiciously, 
And then, in the argument that followed, he only showed deeper and denser ignorance of bicycling. Constable Harris is a brighter young man than the average country constable. With the ready inductiveness of a Sherlock Holmes, he reasoned that a man who had purchased a wheel would naturally take pains beforehand to ascertain the names of different brands and their comparative claims of excellence, and would know what he purchased. And when he finally met his mind, this man evidently did not know even a Columbia when he saw one. Hence, he had not purchased it, the constable calculated. The next day, Constable Harris learned of Mr. Loring's machine, which fit the description, being stolen. And he knew who the man was. Mitchell had, in the meantime, shipped the wheel and left town afoot. Harris pursued. At Lata, 17 miles south, he overtook the fugitive and brought him back to Spokane. The wheel had gone on to Walla Walla, where it was recovered from the express company by the formal process of law. A Sermon to Editors What constitutes a newspaper? Mr. Editor, allow me a few words on this subject. The above heading may seem rather obvious at first, but the real facts of the case are that while many are fully able to do the financiering of a public journal, but few are able to assume the editorial part of it. Upon taking up a paper in a country town, we find items such as, Mr. So-and-so is putting up a fence or barn. Also, Mr. So-and-so are improving the looks of their store with a fine 14-ounce awning and many other such interesting question mark locals which instead of uplifting the paper serve to degenerate it. Another feature which is sadly missed by the average intelligent reader is the lack of editorials. There is no excuse whatsoever for the faultlessness of a paper in that department. The trouble is, the editor relies on his own judgment for the editorials. This is a mistaken idea. The brainy editorial writer interviews men of quick and bright perception and sums together their different opinions, then writes them out accordingly. One thing the editor should bear in mind, and that is not to delude the public by untruths. Now before closing this brief letter, I will say that in a daily paper there should be at least a few columns of the latest press dispatches and not copies three days old with the latest possible date falsely added, hoping that my views will coincide with yours. I remain Cyril. An open letter. Walla Walla is a pretty city of about 7,000 inhabitants. Some claim a larger number, but this is correct. Main and other principal streets are compactly built. The buildings are of brick or imitation stone, two or three stories high. The storerooms are large and impress a stranger with their neatness. The merchant and grocer are able to meet the demands of the most fastidious as the stores contain as great a variety as found in large cities. The streets present a scene of activity. The territory that is covered by this city, if completely built, as the main streets are, would contain 100,000 inhabitants. Many of the blocks have only one or two buildings situated in the center of large lawns, well mown, with an abundance of shade trees and flowers. Let the reader remember that this section contains no forests and that each tree is planted and carefully cultivated. Customs of the people are more like those of the South than the North. The breakneck speed that you see in Chicago and other Eastern cities is wanting here. But the quick, well-measured steps with sufficient time for greeting friends and answering questions are distinctly characteristic. The city has waterworks, electric lights, telephone system, and all the modern improvements. 
It is a city of churches and colleges, of which I will have something to say in a future letter. I was impressed on my first visit around the city by the large number of fruit trees that are seen in almost every yard, and I asked why this custom prevailed, and a friend said, You must remember, we plant all of our trees for shade, and the fruit tree affords us that and a luxury besides. I am surprised at the wonderfully good roads I find here as well as the streets in the city. They have not one particle of rock, but are formed of the earth alone, and are firm and smooth. The rider has been driven over them at the rate of 10 miles per hour, and for miles without a jolt. Social Observations W.D. Gregory has relented his boycott of the barbershops. Spring has come with all her charms, and the young man's heart beats response by shedding his whiskers. On Saturday evening, Miss Stella Berry will give a musical entertainment to her many friends at the handsome residence of Mr. and Mrs. F. M. Polly on 3rd Street. For ice cream, ice cream soda, egg phosphates, lemon, orange, or any other flavor, go to Tom Taylor's. Syrups, strictly fruit juices, ice cream by the gallon on short notice. Owyhee Joe Owyhee Joe had been a famous driver. Wild stories are told of his daring trips from Winnemucca or out from Boise with a coach well loaded with gold dust, prospectors, and government mail. Like Ben Holliday and Yuba Bill, his achievements live in the memory and on the tongues of the oldest inhabitants and grow in luster as the years pass. It was a hot, sultry afternoon. I had just sent in copy for the outside page of the Walla Walla Gazette and felt free to lounge back in my chair and listen to Joe's stirring, if at times mendacious account of an Indian fight he had been in near Kuna. When unaided, he had driven off ten bannocks and saved the gold bricks in the boxes of Wells and Fargo's Express. I smiled patronizingly when he had concluded, And how about the time when you were relieved of your bags without even an if you please? A shade of annoyance and chagrin passed over his bronzed face, and he shifted uneasily in his chair. It was a hotter day than this out there on the mesa, when that young chap stepped out behind a little clump of grease wood, and he asked me perlite enough to throw up my hands. No argument in the face of that thar shootin' iron, Mr. Editor. He took over 4,000 clean dust and made for Salt Lake on the back of my best leader. Never hearn tell how we caught him? No? Well, you see, I took my wheel hoss and I made for Boise. I found Bill McConnell, Colonel Robbins, Jim Agnew, and Hank Fisher. We made a beeline cross country to head him off, changed horses three times. We struck his trail, found where his hoss had broke down and he'd stolen another. That stolen hoss meant a necktie party, sabe? Game up. In 24 hours, we came inside of him. Hoss played out. Game up. Nothing but sand and sagebrush for miles except one lone tree. Kind of place there by Providence, McConnell said. There that young man sat, one laying over the horn of his saddle, fine looker, stood six in his stockings. I knew him the minute I saw eyes on him. He knew me but never twigged. Bill McConnell wore head, and he opened the meeting without singing. Good morning, stranger. Good morning. Seen anything of a man about your size, straddle of a sorrel mare, looking a hay like the one you ride? No, I haven't. That's a pretty good mare, yorn. Yes, she's worth a cool 500, but she's a little winded now. Hey, mister. 
I'll give you 500 to clear for that one of yorn and stop the deal. He was making a good bluff, Mr. Editor. Hoss stealing in them days was death on the stop. He knew we were on to him. His offer would well pay for the broken down hoss, and he wore a banking that his money would pull him through. But you see, he didn't know McConnell. Mac had been a captain of the vigilantes back in 63 up in the basin, and he had a name to keep white. He just smiled at the man's innocence. That's a straight blind o' yorn, pard, and it stands to come in, but we're there and hold you over. You look a little might played out as well as your mare. If you just get down and join a potty, I'll stretch your legs and maybe you need stretching all over. He got a little whiter under the gills, but slid down without a word. We followed suit, and Andrew threw over his head a noose, and passing the other over a limb of that lone old tree, nodded that things were ready. That young feller were game to the last, never moved a muscle, seemed kind of like a darn shame. McConnell went up to him and said, Now, pard, is everything all right? Does it fit your neck according to Hoyle? All right. Have you anything to say why this little picnic shouldn't proceed? Nothing. Have you got any word to leave to your friends? If you have, make it short, for we're going to break camp inside her ten minutes. That young feller took his eyes off a bit of sagebrush for the first time and looked us straight in the eyes. His eyes were blue. I took notice of that, and his face was clean and kind of pure looking. He didn't seem to be taking much interest in what was going around on him. Kind of had a far away, talking to the angels look. Made me feel as though I didn't count no how. Kept thinking of some things I learned in Sunday school in Missouri when I weren't bigger than a basket of papers. Then he came to and drawn a crumbled letter from his pocket, spoke with a kind of tremble in his voice. Perhaps you're a better scholar nor I be. If you'll just read that and be kind enough to answer it, I'll tell you what to say. A letter. McConnell had already passed the coil of rope to Jib Agnew and he had drawn it tight. He took the letter and as he was hung around kind of curious like, he opened it up and read it out loud. Atoa, Georgia, January 18, 1874. My dear son James, for long weary months I've waited for news from you since your last letter to your old mother. God bless you, James, and answer my prayers that this letter may reach you thanking you for your ever thoughtful care of me in my old age. But once more to look in your dear face and feel my baby boy was near me would cheer my old heart more than to possess all the gold in Idaho. When are you coming home? You promised me back in the spring you would come back to me. May the good Lord watch over you and prosper you and return my dear boy to my old arms before I die. From your loving mother. Joe paused and looked vacantly up at the ceiling. His eyes followed the drunken gyrations of a yellow wasp. The heavy rumble of a great cylinder warned me that the outside pages were going to press and that still more copy would soon be needed. Still, I waited in silence. That letter did the business. McConnell had a good education back in Michigan, and he commenced in a strong, clear voice, but afore the closing words were out, it were all we could do to hear his voice. Yes, sir, and my eyes got weaker and the sick heifers. Fact. The rope slackened until it fell from the hands of Jim Agnew. And the breath of the morning came a-rushing through the leaves of that darned old tree, and long shafts of sunlight kind of prospected down through the opening boughs, 
Same way me old throat caved in like I weren't to thinkin' of long sunny days on the banks of the Missouri and me old dog and having a little sister with eyes just like this feller's. And if my old mammy could see how she taught me to pray, couldn't help it, Mr. Editor. But borrowing a horse and robbing a stage didn't seem a big enough thing to string that boy up for and break his old mother's heart. Guess McConnell were thinking the same way, for he kind of reverently like folded up that soiled bit of paper and handed it to his owner, and without a word, slipped the noose from his neck, and then in tones as gentle as a mother's asked, Were you going home, stranger? Yes. Goodbye. The boy didn't dare trust his voice and thanks. I knew how he felt, but he drew from his belt a small bag of twenties and offered it to Mac. Hoss? No, you take her and goodbye. He mounted the mare while we sat and watched him out of sight and then, like a pack of starved coyotes, turned and silently sneaked for Boise. Court was adjourned. Verdict sought aside, he concluded, while I leaned back in my mind filled with dramatic rehearsal. Well, so long, old man, I'm off. And the rough old Jehu shuffled out of the room, all unmindful of either the moral or the artistic points of his story.